it is nothing like what, what I have imagined. I was absolutely hopeless when we started the course. Uh, the process that you go through is amazing. Structure for my training, my workshops, what I'll be doing from now on. Now, just to tell you, I was 14 years old and left school because I didn't want to speak in front of the class. I leave here today, overcoming that fear. It's given me my confidence back. It's enabled me to get up back up on stage. And you're going to become more powerful, clearer in your message, on point, and you're going to feel like you're part of a tribe. You can't miss it. This is a total investment in you and your future. And if you are considering coming along, do not hesitate. The transformation from day to day truly is incredible. If you're looking to get your message out, I highly recommend that you join Sam and the team for their boot camp. Powerful, spectacular. Incredible. Awesome. Fantastic. Amazing journey. You've got to come. You've got to be here. Try them. Honestly, it'll change your life. What if I told you that there is a place where you can dream big? A place where you can learn how to be an influencer. A place where you can collaborate with others. What if I told you that there is a group of people just like you? A group that's committed impact. That believes in what's possible for them. What if I told you that we can help you make a difference? We can arm you with the right tools to never be underpaid, undervalued, and underrecognized. What if I told you that you can join today? Like right now. It's time to make a difference. It's time to shine. This is Speaker's Tribe. Thing that I that I want to acknowledge you about is investing in yourself and ultimately spending time in online education. If you can learn how you can influence more powerfully through video, if you can learn how to create like your online virtual product and even make money online right now, then I'd love to help you uh, through that journey as well. To all the staff from Speakers Institute, you guys have been really supportive and really, really lovely and encouraging. But to everybody else, for all of your honesty and your courage for stepping up here and just giving all, because I've learned so much from every single one of you and it's just been really, really good. I just wanted to say being out of the workforce for six years, looking after little kids and this is the first course I've ever done and it was astounding, it blew my mind, it was beyond my expectations. And thank you, Kate, for the feedback today. That was brilliant. And it's given me the confidence to back myself because I didn't have that before. Because, you know, when you leave for a while and you come back, it's all a bit dodgy. So thank you. Sam, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That has been absolutely awesome. I've learned a hell of a lot today. And I really feel like we're all improving. So thank you so much. It's been oh, really awesome. I wish everyone all the best on this on the course. I think it was a wonderful course. And Sam, you've created a, a, an amazing business. But I also want to congratulate the people you've got working underneath you because it wouldn't be that great if you didn't have all this wonderful resource. And I congratulate them for supporting you. It's excellent. I'd actually just like to thank Sam and the team so much for everything you've done. But I'd really like to thank everybody else. I have learned so much from all of you. It's just been so exhilarating. I'm so excited for each and every one of you because it's just the growth in such a short space of time has been phenomenal. So thank you all very, very much. I have fear um, of uh, public speaking and that's the reason why I joined bootcamp and I expected a self-transformation as um, Sam claimed. Join me, stop thinking, stop overthinking, stop your negative thoughts and start action, do something. Follow your heart, follow your dream and be my guest. Maybe it's now, now your turn to be on the front. 
Maybe it's your turn to no longer be behind the sign behind. It's now time for you to shine. Mm. Shine your light brighter than what it ever has been. What I got out of this um, extensive boot camp is what he promised. I we did really have a self transformation. I I feel the process of self transformation myself, and I'm really thankful for the team and uh, the company that you created this platform for everybody and a person like me. I'm so lucky that I found you guys. Thank you so much. Welcome to Speakers TV and wherever you are in the world, there is a reason why you've joined here on this amazing Wednesday. Guys, in this episode, we're going to bring to you some of the best speakers, some of the best influencers, and not only that, we're also showcasing a number of our students who have gone on to either write best-selling books, to be on TEDx stages, or ultimately get them to share their journey on how they made it for an ordinary life through to knowing exactly exactly what their story is and then ultimately learning how to get that story out there. We truly believe in you and I'm really glad you're tuning in to our Wednesday episode of Speakers TV. We'll see you on the other side. And one thing I found, you know, with um, Michael being my mentor is he constantly helps me to raise my standards in both areas, in both charisma uh, but also character as well. So we've actually uh, arranged a two-hour workshop with, come on, very, very cool, with, uh, with the one and only Michael Grinder. Let's give him a hand. I just think it's amazing for me to come every year and look at the culture and how it emerges and how it changes and how it morphs. My reaction to coming through the door was, that's an introvert's nightmare. <laughs> but we have a good balance in here of both the extrovert and the introvert. And I love watching our speakers yesterday afternoon. There were so many of them, they were up there, and they knew that their task right now was to be in service to you. And they were vulnerable, they shared, and it made a difference. So if I may, would you join me one more time, yesterday afternoon speakers that we had. Yeah. I have been fascinated, probably because of what Sam was saying earlier, I taught eighth grade, year eight. So I had to figure out, how do you survive? And I was trying to figure out, there's got to be a way to understand communication in general. So I came up with an idea of house of communication. We're going to see it in just a second. It's on YouTube. It's longer than the normal one to three minute YouTube. It's eight minutes long. I would recommend, especially if you're coming for the four day in Sydney, see it twice. If you're not coming to Sydney, see it three times because you're not coming. <laughs> and what it does is it properly looks at the four floors of communication. The first floor is content. The content determines which nonverbals you choose. But the second floor is how do you deliver it? So if you want to make it real easy, and you have some post-its in front of you, and what we're going to recommend is if we say something and you want to take a note, take a note. But please, if it's something you say, nope, I need to have this as part of my repertoire, you write it on a post-it at the end of two hours. I hope you have three to five post-its. We gave you seven for those people that are ambitious. And what you do is you then take your post-its and go to a physical calendar, not an electronic on your phone. <laughs> and you put a post-it on the next three to five Mondays, because it takes you a whole week to practice one skill. And it makes part of your repertoire if repetition, repetition. And the thing I like about talking about nonverbals you don't have to be a speaker. You just have to be a communicator. And then you go, got it. I need this. So the second floor of the house of communication is the delivery system. So if you want, this is the what, this is the how. And the difference between those is that if you know your how, your what comes across better. 
there's two other floors. These two floors, I'm going to show you the video in just a second. This is called the science of communication. This is called the art. What is the difference? Because we want to give you an overview before you see the video. When you're doing the science, there's a sense in which you always do this, never do that. Example, most of our speakers yesterday did a brilliant job of showing how they've been trained. They almost always started left to right because people read left to right. Just go to China, good luck. Now what happens <laughs> is as you're going left to right, that's the past, that's the future. This is the problem, that's the solution. And that's basically the structure that we had yesterday. But I caution you, please be aware that yes, that is a norm that you want to follow, left to right. But it's the science. It's not the art. There's many times where it's better to have that be the past and this be the future. So the way I think about it is we've got to study beyond just always do this, never do that. We've got to get beyond that. And that's what my mission is, to help people be aware of and have choices about how to deliver their content. So the four corridors we have on the second floor is what are you doing with your face, especially eye contact, your voice patterns, your kinesthetic, and your breathing. Now, these first three, you can take individual skills from them, practice your post-it for a week, you'll have it. When it comes to breathing, it's a five-year commitment. And you have to study a lot of video footage at fast forward. Just take any footage you have of yourself already or someone else, put it on a screen, and then 2x forward, you'll see breathing. Because it's so infrequent, you don't notice what's going on. So you have to speed up reality to catch timing. So that's why this takes a lot longer to do. Now, look at your little one-page paper that we gave you. We can now give you a mystery solved. In the second paragraph, you'll see the same color coding that you see on the flip chart up here. The green stands for visual. The red stands for your voice. The blue stands for kinesthetic. And that is supposed to be an earth tone brown orange, in case you're wondering what breathing is. Now, the reason why we want to give you this as a one-page summary, in trying to figure out what are the steps to mastery we came up with something and went, I can't believe this is the pattern. It starts with the kinesthetic. When I studied this, came up with it about a year ago here in Australia, I went, my goodness. Most of us look at the A because it's connected to the idea of the first floor. You go, I have to make sure I get my verbal down. Yes. Now get it aside. Now figure out, of the four, start with the kinesthetic. The kinesthetic is your key to making sure that you can go all the way up to the mastery level. Now, it's a little hard to see, but I have some blocks here for the first two rows. You'll be able to see it rather well. And these are the building blocks of all communication. The visual, the auditory, the kinesthetic, and the breathing. It's your foundation. But the sequence and how you do it makes a huge difference. Now, if you want to look at that, you may want to take and consider, I call it the zero because it's present at all times, and that is your breathing. So we're not going to do breathing today. It's way, way up there. It's the art but we can do the science. So we're going to be looking at what you do, three steps of just kinesthetics, and then you can start adding what your voice pattern is like. Look how far you have to be advanced before you ever do your eyes. Eyes are huge, and most of us start off, always make eye contact. That's why you'll see people that are speakers, and they have a PowerPoint, and they'll go like this. And our next slide is, and they never turn and look. What happens to you is you're in a bind. You've been trained socially 
that if I make eye contact with you, you should keep eye contact with me. And even if I go, no, don't look at me. Look up here. Look. It still won't work. <laughs> so your eyes have to be one of the last things you learn how to handle. And you set it up by understanding what comes before eye contact. Same thing in terms of flip chart. Just go like this sometimes. Uh, would you look up here, please? Don't look at my face. Look up here. <laughs> so you need to understand, what is the priority? What is the order of doing the seven steps to mastery? And that's what we're going to cover today. Now, when you look at this, I want to strongly suggest that the steps that we have, please consider. You can't skip any of them. You got to start with the kinesthetic. So we've color coded them so you understand what aspect or what quarter of the second floor of the House of Communication you're working on at any given moment. We're going to have you be in groups of twos and threes. You get to experience this. We want you to experience when you're on the receiving end, sending end, what is the difference when someone does it, what we recommend, and times when you don't. But remember, this is all the science. I'm going to say, always do this, never do this. As soon as you get to the art, screw the science. What does the audience want you to do? But that's advanced. One of the things I'm experimenting with, very excited about. I work a lot with education just because I'm a former teacher. And one of the things that we're trying to figure out, what is the equivalent for an educator? Because this is called house of communication in general, generic. <coughs> But what about for teachers? And we found it's a very different kind of format. For us to understand education, you have to understand the classroom through what's called educational binoculars. One tube looks at the curriculum. The other one looks at management. And what we're finding is, because I'm a management expert, nonverbals, that I can get people to be really good at management, but they, do they know how to teach? The first floor. you got to have the first floor. So we're trying to figure out how to do this. So one of the experiments we're doing, we have to see if artificial intelligence is going to allow us, is to put on a virtual reality goggles. And you have six or seven students on your scene in front of you that match the grade level that you're teaching or are going to teach. And then these characters, these robots, avatars. They have little knobs that the outside person, so here's the new teacher, here's the person who's going to be the director of student teaching, and I can dial it up so that they're all like this. <laughs> and I can dial it down. And we want to see if someone can maintain teaching a lesson when no one cares. <laughs> and that may sound funny because most of the time you say, you've got to start off with group dynamics. Going, that's the west wall. That's way too advanced. How do you get people to survive? How do you get people to be competent? And what we're finding is, at least our initial experiment, is that if you can go through a whole lesson and not be bothered, especially by teens and preteens, the rolling of the eyes, if you can keep your message strong, then we can teach you all the management that will make it easy. But we've got to figure out, can you get through your content? And I strongly suggest, once you've memorized your content, start on your steps. You've got to have the content down before you come to this. But please, somewhere on this or on a post-it, write yourself a note. This is science. This is not art. What you, when you get in front of your audience, you've got to change. You've got to be flexible. You've got to do the F of roof and what a difference it makes. So let's start. Let's look at the very first one, which is the kinesthetic. Would you please pair up with someone next to you, introduce yourself, no groups of four, two or three. Talk to each other, talk to each other.
Would you now count off who's one, who's two? Some of you will have three. Who's one, who's two, who's three? So count off. Once raise your hand. Once raise your hand. Once, once. In just a second, let me demonstrate first. In just a second, I'm going to ask you to stand. Not if you're in a wheelchair, my friend out there, but everyone else. You're going to stand. You're going to stand in front of your partner. And what we're going to do is we're going to show you the difference if you take your hands, they're at your side, and you go like this. You're going to open a show. You're going to open a training, and you go like this. My name is Michael Grinder. Number one, stand. Make sure your hands are at your side. Don't say my name is Michael Grinder, but <laughs> OK, go. Face your partner, go. Second person, we're going to show you something that is going to be so easy. You go, really? Yeah. We're going to pretend you're now seated, and you're going to be speaking at maybe a committee. So in norm, the norm is normally if there's 16 or under people, you probably are sitting. If there's 25 and above, you're probably standing. I know. What is 17 be 24? Come on, come on, come on, come on. All right, so now, number two, you're going to be seated. And all we're going to do is going to have you rest your elbows on the table. And you're going to keep your elbow on the table. You're going to say, my name is, and you're going to go like this. Then the second time, you're going to have your elbow off the table, and you're going to say, my name is. And the person who's your partner is going to notice which one do you like best. Touching furniture, my name is. Not touching furniture, my name is. Practice, go, go. Instead of saying one or two, we're going to say the next person. Because if you're in a group of two, it's different than if you're in a group of three. So the next person, would you please now look at your paper and look at stage number one, and you'll see a code there that needs to be explained. It says gestures. Keep the gestures, the hands, above the elbows. So whenever you're communicating, even when you finish whatever you're going to say and you're going to come back to a rest position, try to bring the hands back parallel to the ground. Try not to talk and then drop. Keep the hands up. Why? Because when you go from here, my name is, the timing is off. Whereas if your elbows are parallel to the ground, my name is, it looks better. So just communication is set up in silence for when you talk. You're switching the mode. But there's a code here that's called BBI. And we want to show you what BBI is. It stands for belly button insecurity. And it's one of the biggest things you want to avoid. Now, how does this come into play? If you were talking and you're making a point and you're gesturing, and if I may, the people yesterday, great gestures. Great gestures. But when you finish a gesture and you want to hold their attention, you have to leave the hand still during the pause. You can't bring the hand back during the pause. Because when you do it, it looks like you have BBI. It's called belly button insecurity. Yep, it's still there. I'll be right back. OK. <laughs> and every time you talk and do continuous talking, so the hand stays still until you're going to talk again, then everything you say is one concept. Because every time you drop your hands back to your belly button or drop it down to your legs, you're separating the content before the pause with what is after the pause. It's got to be connected in their minds, because then it's unified. So knowing that, if you keep watching me, even if I turn sideways and I pause, I have to keep the hand still. I cannot move it until I talk again. Then I can talk and move. That habit is the opposite of what's called belly button insecurity. So who's ever next, you're either going to stand or sit. You have a choice. But we want to make sure that you just say anything you want to say, and then keep bringing your hands back to your belly button. After you've done this for two or three things that you've said, then go ahead and talk, and then not bring it back. Talk some more, and see if the person that's your partner, which one they think is more intelligent. Because one of the things you have to come across <laughs> if you're going to lead a group is they have to trust that you're intelligent. This is the gesture of intelligence. The hand is frozen during all pauses. And it stays frozen until you talk again. So you can either stand or sit. Do it wrong, do it right. Ready? You have about three minutes. Go. There is a smaller version of this. So this is called BBI, just a silly way of saying it. 
But there's something else you can do. If you gesture and you keep your hands away from coming back to your midsection, that's what you want. But you gotta be careful that you curl your fingers during the pause. And if I may, I have six biological sisters. I'm well trained that females are trained at a very early age, do not take up space on earth. Take up space. Keep those fingers out because that's the communication. Males will do this, but females will go like this. So what you want to do is stay seated now. If you're in a group of three, all three of you are going to talk at the same time. But just talk, pause, and curl your fingers. Then talk and keep your fingers out and notice what a difference it is. This is definitive. This is, I hope you didn't mind. Uh-uh. You make them mind. <laughs> you keep those fingers out, ladies. Try it both ways. Go, go. Stay seated, everyone. One of the things that you'll find as a communicator, if you want to become a trainer, speaker, coach, and those are all different categories, are you more comfortable seated or standing? And you're going to find that if you can do stand, then you're going to do sit even better. So people that learn to communicate from a seated position, they get sloppy, and especially they don't know what to do with their hands. So if you learn how to do a stand communication, it's different. Now, the major difference between the two is that when I sit, my pauses have to be shorter. And my gesture can't come out from my torso too far. If I stand, my gestures come out. So standing is an amplification of seated. That's why if you have a big audience, a thousand people, actually they can't see me. They're seeing me up on these. So therefore I have to hold my gesture even longer. It has to come out farther. And you're gonna find that there's a huge difference between males and females in terms of how far can you gesture away from your torso and still maintain your masculinity or femininity if you're interested in that. And that's an art question, that is not a science question. There's lots of times I could care less about my gender. I care about getting the results that I need based on what I've been trained or hired to do. So if you keep watching me, I'm gonna pretend that I'm gonna go mute. I'm gonna move my lips and I'm not gonna say anything because I want you just to watch the hands The same thing is true. The difference is I'm going to extend farther out from my torso, and I have to hold the pause longer. You almost have to have more weight on your legs when you're standing versus seated. So I again ask you, rhetorically, so don't answer, are you more comfortable seated or standing? Make sure you can do both. Because you're going to find that the standing industry is pretty crowded. But coaching, mentoring is not. And literally, I would recommend use my paper, leave the copyright on it if you would please, and use it as a way of understanding how to help people. A CEO.
structure of how you hold people's attention. And once you do, you realize, wow, these are all things. Everything on that page is true. Bottom one to zero, where it talks about breathing. No, here. One through once a week, you can do it. Step further. We've already this and avoid this. Be sensitive to the fact I come from a, in which I did not vote for him. <laughs> Communicate when I'm on flight. I'm there. I never say I'm from there. Service. Where it says U.S. Now, the reason why I say that is both in the country I come from and the country I'm a host, okay, you're going through a tremendous policy. Diff this and brush was doing to end up for it. There's what you're touching, probably not. You look at number to come. Pause. Excellent pausers. What we would like to add is every time you talk, you have to gesture. And every time you pause, you have to freeze the gesture. Make this your default behavior. Just grab your phone, set it up, talk for three minutes, study the person on the film. By the way, never study yourself. If you're a female, you study her. If you're a male, you study him. Study the person as if it's not you. So you can get by all the vanity. Why they wear that outfit? Don't go there. Don't go there. Oh, I am balding. I'm really balding a lot. <laughs> Stop it. Study the form. And the way you do that is you use the term either the speaker or the communicator or him or her. Use pronouns when you study yourself, and you'll learn so much more. One of my good friends is Amanda Gore, if you know that name. And I've worked with her for over 30 years. And when I get together with her, and we did last year, when we study her on film, we never study Amanda sitting next to me. You've got to learn to be a critical friend to yourself. And the way you do that is pronouns. Makes a nice difference in terms of your communication. Now, the next level is this. What are we going to do in terms of some kind of a content for talk? And we're going to do this. We're going to ask you in just a second. Need me? You good? OK. You're going to take turns standing. And when it's your turn, you're going to stand and say, my name is, and then finish that sentence. Pause, pause, pause. Frozen hand gesture, frozen hand gesture. I was born, say where you were born. Different gesture. Make it interesting. Come on, come on, come on. Pause. Freeze, freeze, freeze. Everything is frozen. And then you're going to say, the city I'd like to visit is. So it's going to look like this. My name is Michael Grinder. I was born in Detroit, Michigan. And the place I'd like to visit is Margaret River. Watch it one more time with the sound off. And this is what you do with favorite clips from movies on YouTube. Turn off the sound. Watch it. And you'll be amazed. That's why they're so good. Make sure you take turns doing this. Now, you're going to have three minutes. I recommend when you do this, and you have two or three of you doing it, do a second round and improve him or her even more. But everyone in the room is standing at this point. Let's go. Practice, practice, practice. Two rounds. When you stand, your gestures are more blatant, and the length of the pause is longer. You want to rehearse even what you're going to say seated from a standing position so that when you go into reality and you're going to now do a seated communication, you've already rehearsed. But if you rehearse a seated from a seated position, you'll get sloppy. You won't know if you really have that pause, if you really froze. Whereas if you stand, it really makes a difference. Now, when we say freeze, we normally say freeze body. It's actually freeze everything. Example. My name is Michael Grinder. I was born in Detroit, Michigan. I want to visit Margaret River. So my hands were fine, but my mouth opened. And one of the things that is extremely unfair in the Western culture is if you're a mouth breather, you will not be as intelligent 
as if you're a nose breather. Now, women's structure of their mouth area is very different than males. And if I may, I would recommend just watch transgender and the operations they go through. And one of them is to change the structure of the upper lip, depending if you're going male or female or female to male. So females are allowed to have their mouth, their, their uh, lips parted. My name is Michael Grinder. That's perfectly OK. Whereas males have to go, my name is Michael Grinder. So there's slight differences in terms of your audience determines how male or female you're allowed to be. You don't get to, I'm just being myself. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. Just, just go at least to three other countries away from where you are now, and you can't be yourself. You're a guest. You've got to respect the nonverbals of that culture. Folks, I really don't think we're going to have world peace if we speak each other's language because it's only the first floor. You've got to respect the nonverbals of the second floor. Then that makes a difference. Now you're going deeper into the culture. Even if you do it wrong, they anticipate you tried. They will give you the benefit of the doubt by just being, try to accommodate them. And if I may, that's why I hate being a tourist. I never learn anything. It's when I come off the main drag when the cruise ship docks and go over three or four blocks and get lost and wonder if I'm still safe. Now I figure out if I got culture or not. Please, use vacations as a way to expand the way you think about visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and breathing. And if you have any special needs, people in your world, you are blessed because you'll be training yourself. You can't make eye contact. You, can't, you don't come up like this. You come up like this. Why? Because that's their culture. Individual has culture, yes. But understand that difference. Now, let's go a little step further. Go to step three on your handout. And look at the concept of pause. Pause is really, really important to come across as intelligent. But we're going to talk about pre-pause and post-pause and the difference between it. If I pause before I say something, I add credibility to what I'm about to say. If I say something, and then I pause afterwards. It goes into your long-term memory. So I need to make sure that I have to do it based on the first floor, which is content. For instance, if I do a pre-pause and my sentence is, my name is, and I pause, people are going to go, no, this is not good. He doesn't know his name. <laughs> so you, you have to avoid pre- and post-pause based on your content. You still learn everything of the seven steps, but when you get in reality, it's got to be different. But if I say, as I did here, just a minute, and then I'm about to say where I'd like to visit. And I'd like to visit, and now I pause. That pause means that whatever I say is like a secret. I'm sharing it with you. I add to the credibility, and I say Margaret River. So this is a pre-pause. Just a minute, I'll go to do. Do do what? Margaret River. <laughs> and if you go to a whisper when you do following a pre-pause, it's even more powerful. It's called inspire. You have a sentence structure. You have messages you want to deliver. Every person yesterday afternoon had messages, good messages. Now just go back and figure out what's the main message. I've got to drop as I'm saying that sentence. Pause, pause, pause. Sit it up. Now whisper it. You know. We're going to say it together. We're going to say, I'd like to visit Margaret River. Ready? Have your hand out. Go. I'd, I'd like to visit Margaret River. Now all we're going to do is we're going to say, I'd like to visit. Pause. Then you're going to say Margaret River. Ready? Go. I'd, I'd like to visit Margaret River. Now we're going to whisper as we say Margaret River. <laughs> Ready? Go. Inspire is not hard. The question is, the fourth floor, do you have permission to inspire? 
I've gone days with the same group and I don't have permission to inspire. But do I know how to inspire? Can I recognize when they have given me permission? Then can I pull it off? I have to be patient. I have to wait. I do not get to determine my success. The group determines that, not me. I have to give myself grace. And if I may, when I talk to my wife, because we Skype almost every day, and she says, how'd it go? And I say, ah, I didn't do well. She will always chuckle. <laughs> I said, stop it. She goes, I know, but I know you'll do differently tomorrow. Not the same. I have to go to the F of roof. I've got to be flexible. So understanding what you have in front of you, the receptivity, what a difference that makes. Now notice after I say Margaret River, if I do a post pause, Margaret River sinks into your memory longer than if I go, my dad, and I'd like to go to Margaret River. I didn't stay there long enough. It's Margaret River. Pause. Look at Margaret River. Margaret River is right there. <laughs> Everyone says Margaret River. And it has high credibility. So what we want you to do is would you please just pick it up right here. Stay seated or, or stand. I recommend standing. And all you're going to do is you're going to do the visit with a pre and a post pause and a visit without the pre and post pause. Here's without. Margaret River. I'd like to visit Margaret River. Pre and post pause. If I want to add inspire. Sometimes Margaret River does inspire and sometimes Margaret River doesn't. I'd like to visit Margaret River. Stand, practice. Come on. Pre and post pause. Get it. Get it. Get it. A question. Would you hold up with fingers the number of post-its you have filled out so far? Okay. I'm hoping you're about two to three at this point, just in terms of our progress, because we're one hour in to our two-hour program. I want to make sure that you end up with three to five. And feel free to get other post-its if you want to go beyond seven that we've passed out for you. We're going to go to the next step. The next step, step four, we're increasing our sophistication now. And we're going to start looking at the pause in terms of content before the pause and content after the pause. Do you want to join these two parts together? That's what you've been trained in so far. But there's times when you want to actually separate this before the pause with the content after the pause. In general. What you have to do is you have to avoid what's called contamination. So you want to decontaminate. If you're going to say something negative, I recommend, and it's your choice, I recommend that that is not connected with your main message. Otherwise, you become contaminated. Now, yesterday, it was obvious that the way you've been trained is to do a negative looking at the audience. Everyone did it. You looked, as you said, a negative. So this was the original <laughs> learning that Sam and I did, and I'm fine if Sam disagrees. But I want you to be aware. If you are a keynote speaker, and most keynote speakers have some tragedy, drama, oftentimes very, very in terrible things, and you look at the audience when you say that, you are delivering that to them. I almost killed myself. You just program killing. Now, you don't have to agree, but this is my ethics. You have to leave people in a better place than you found them. Go to any kind of an event where you have every 45 minutes, a new speaker on stage. And hour after hour, they're delivering all this negative. You don't walk away going, yeah. You walk away, yeah, I auto and I feel crummy inside at the same time. You've given a mixed message. So I suggest, it's just my suggestion, you can't look at people when you say a negative. Now this, to me, is ethical. It's not just style, it's ethics. So if I'm going to say, and almost kill myself, compare that with, and I almost killed myself. 
But what I learned from that is, now I deliver the positive. I've got to figure out, I want them to associate me with the positive, not the negative. And I certainly don't want to give them my negative. So now you have to revamp all of your content, first floor. Be careful. Keynote speakers have tragedy. And the thing I worry about, not just the audience, are you reliving your own therapy? You really have to understand. If you're associated and you go back through, you're doing therapy in front of them. Some groups want you to do that. But the general public do not. And especially if you're asking for money from a corporation. You go in and you give them, you just keep hitting them with the negative. There's so much abuse, there's so much this, there's so much that going on. Yeah, they're going to feel guilty. Yeah, they're going to give you money. But are they going to feel good about themselves? You have to figure out whether that is your message or not. So I recommend negative is always done off to the side. You cannot face the audience. You have to contain it. The use of location yesterday was brilliant by every person that came up here. We had many people that knelt down. There was just location usage was great. All I recommend is it's got to be off to the side. So all we're going to ask you to do in just a second, you're going to stand. And we're going to go almost in. And all you're going to do is have your hands and eyes off to the side. So you put it over there. It's a phantom location that you're creating. Stand. Stand. The wording's going to be, and I almost did. That's it. Even when you do rehearsal, please be clean about what you're saying. So let me do it first. And I almost did blah, blah, blah. Get ready. Go. Now, your, your toes have to be pointed to where your hands are. Watch. If I'm here, my toes are pointed towards the audience, and I take my torso and I go off to the side, I promise you're going to come right back. You've got to make sure if you're going to do a hand gesture with your eyes supporting the hand gesture, the toes have to be there too. This is further up on number six. So watch it again. And I almost did blah, blah, blah. My toes are pointing that way. Ready? Go. Blah, blah, blah. Keep the hands. See, she wants to leave. You've got to cement that location so you can go to a different location. Watch her again. She's going to do it again. And I almost did blah, blah, blah. She stays still. It sinks into your mind. Take this location, contain it, step away from it, and now reframe it. But she's got to establish the location. Now watch her do it directly the wrong way and do it directly at them, and I almost did. And I almost did, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, fix it. I feel real good. I'm so glad I attended. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Once you understand, how do I take blah, 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 and I get it, the blah, blah, blah is over here. And I almost did blah, blah, blah. Now the question is, what do I do? This is where it gets really tricky. And what you're going to find is the following. If you want to join content, you already know. You freeze your gesture during the pause, and then you just gesture when you start talking again. That's your default. You already know that. Now we're going to teach you how to separate. To separate, you move in silence, you settle, and then you talk again. You move in silence, you settle, then you talk again. Now you have two different locations. That's what you want to do. I'll do it in gibberish. What I learned from that, I mean, and refer to it. If I go back over there, I'm going to re-enter it. So you got to take wherever that negative is, and you got to preserve it. Don't go back over there unless you want to go back over there. Watch it one more time. It would be done in kata, silence.
Now watch the hands. The hands are going to shrink. They're going to fold. They're going to do a milk. I'm going to look down. I'm going to move my hands and my feet all at the same time. I come back over here. I step back. I have my hands come up. I have my eyes come up. And now I talk about, and what I learned from that is, what I learned from that is, we're going to do it together. Get ready. So you're facing me. You're saying, blah, blah, blah. Ready, go. Blah, blah, blah. Now we're going to go sideways. We're going to say, and I almost did. Ready, go. Make sure both feet are pointed in the same direction. The weight are on both feet. Don't drag, a, don't drag a foot. Now that you have that, we're going to count three, two, one. At one, fingers curl, hands come back, and you step all at the same time. Three, two, one. Start. Okay, now do it again. This is the movement you really, really want. Watch me, watch me. My hands, my head, and my feet are all coordinated. Everything comes towards me. And I can't, I can't. see, if I go like this, I just brought it back. So this is where I want to curl. I want to melt. Every behavior you have is good if you know when to use it. So all I'm doing is going like this. I'm stepping back, still looking down. My hands are coming up. My eyes are coming up. And now I pop open and say, and what I learned from that is, let's say that part. And what one more time. And what? Okay, now we're going to do it together. Get ready. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. I almost did. Waiter on both feet. Get ready. You have your post pause. You have found it. Three, two, one. Curl. Step back, step back. Step away. Here we go. And what? Okay, now practice with each other. Practice with each other. You have about a minute and a half. Go. Practice. If, if you are coaching someone that has a high position, a lot of times they have to say bad news. I would recommend this particular step is going to be your favorite. You can help them preserve the relationship with their staff, their organization, while still being extremely honest with what a deficit we have financially. But you have to have two different locations. When you work with people that are presenting in front of their staff organization, and it's above 25 people, they get the stand. Number one thing I recommend, two flip charts, because now you have two, two different locations. An example might look something like this. Starting off with my arms parallel to the ground. Thank you for coming. This is our second quarter review. We want to look at what our goals are. What we have found is blah, blah, blah. Watch it again. This may seem small, but it's huge. I do not want to say, thank you for coming. It's our second quarter. Then I don't drop my hands, come over here, because now this is separate from that. I want to keep everything together that is similar. Just a minute, can I? Okay, so bye. Now watch the hand. I cannot move my body or my hand or my eyes unless I'm talking. Just a minute, can I? I'm like, I I make sure that if I'm going to join, I talk and move at the same time. That skill is so powerful. The human brain can handle about three to five new ideas. So you can have someone open a program, and during the preface, they wear out the three to five already. You've got to understand the brain, how it works, how to join things together. So join is your default behavior. Separate is the one that you have to learn. Now watch it again. Just a minute, check it out. And we're going to be covering blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Now pretend this flip chart is all the way across the stage. And I go like this. Before we begin, I look down. I make no eye contact. I walk over. Because I have a frozen hand gesture, you'll follow me. I get over here, and I go like this. Our revenue is down by 15%. I pause so much. Why? If I pause as a leader, you have confidence in me. And you want the proof of that? Just get on an airplane. Those pilots are trained how to be calm. They don't say, hey, put on your seatbelts. <laughs> the last, this is true, the last test you have as a pilot for an airline is that the test people are in another room because your looks 
will override what your style of your voice is so that they have to make sure that it's like the voice. They can't have to hear you. And you have to pass the test of showing competence. And if you want to know what that voice sounds like, go to YouTube and just type in, land the plane on the Hudson River. Listen to that voice. Now, I could not live with a voice like that. But I want that voice flying my plane. There's a difference. So listen to, again as we see it. Our revenue is down by 15%. Watch if I do it wrong. Our revenue is down by 15%. Don't hate me. <laughs> You're my leader? If you really want to go back to the idea, it's a cute saying, a breather. If you're going to be my leader, you have to be a breather. If you're going to be the head of the household, you have to be a breather. Power does not work, especially in a crisis. But what does confidence look like? It's on the piece of paper. Now watch it again. You're going to do this in just a second. You can pretend you have a flip chart here. You're going to have your hand come out. Have the hand closest to the audience. Because if you do this one, and you hear people go, because they thought it was only down by 10%, and you're announcing it's 15%. If they go, you'll turn and look at them. Whereas if you use the hand closest to the audience, you can't turn and look. So the arm you point with is critical. The little things, the nonverbals allow you to communicate very difficult conversations, or in the case of the title of some books, fierce conversations. But do it with dignity to yourself as well as them. We're going to go like this. Our revenue is down by 15%. Stand, stand. Flip chart off to the side, flip chart off to the side. Arm out. You have to weight on both feet equally. Make sure the arm closest to the audience is the one you're pointing with. The wording is going to be our revenue. Ready, go. Our revenue is down by 15%. Now watch, watch, watch. If you start going like this, you're doing the belly button. See, it, it's straight down. I'm confident. Our revenue is down. I'm taking because I'm giving you confidence. Ready? Our revenue. Now, once you do that and you've said this, now the question is how do I want to get back over there? The whole purpose of this. I have to make sure that I'm going to move in silence. I'm going to settle by wiggling my hips just a pinch, and then I talk. Now I have two different locations. So, having said this, my hand is here. I leave it frozen. Post pause sinks in the information down by 15%. Now watch. Head, eyes, hand all together. Just that movement alone. Get used to it. The idea of understanding that, and all you do is you come back all the way over here. Settle, settle, settle. Do not look at them yet. Come all the way up. And I'll say, now, what are we going to do about that, and you can raise your voice at a flip chart all you want. <laughs> you can raise your voice about abuse. You can raise your voice about injustices, but not at your audience. They deserve dignity. They deserve to have a good day. Why are we doing shame and guilt? I don't understand that ethically. But you're trained. It's part of our culture. So you've got to figure out how to clean up your act. And it starts on the content level. Your content determines what nonverbals you're going to use. So some of you have great programs. You just have to get it off to the side so people feel good about themselves. Now we're going to walk through this together. Here we go. So I do, then you do. So let me finish, then go. 
Our content today is, and just say blah, 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 blah. Now watch me, watch me, let me do it first. I'm gonna drop this hand, the hand closest to the audience, I'm gonna gesture with it and say, before we begin, I'm gonna turn and look down. I don't look at you as I walk over to the negative spot. I wanna keep this apart from that. Eyes separate. Watch the people in the newscast. <laughs> the teleprompt's right there, and they go, blah, 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 blah. In other news today, for some reason, breaking of eye contact separates paragraphs. So then you have two different locations. So watch again. I've just said all of this. I'm now going to go like this. Before we begin, and I'm going to turn and walk in place. Otherwise, you bump into the person next to you. Ready? Go. Before we begin, turn, walk, 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 walk. Now settle, 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 settle. Have your hands ready, the one closest to the audience. Our revenue, ready, go. Our revenue is down by 15%. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Post pause, post pause. It's sinking in. Get ready in just a second. Our hand comes back, our head goes down, and we step all at the same time. Three, two, one. Move, move, move back. Turn towards the audience. You have to wait on both feet. If you just wiggle, just a pinch. I'm serious on this. That wiggle, that is one of the most important things you can find yourself doing because it will allow you to breathe deeper. If you come back, like if you, if you almost talk coming into it, down by 15%. Now, what are we going to do about that? No. Get here. Settle. This spot is different than that spot. You create the reality for them based on your systematic use of nonverbals. What a difference that makes. So when you come back here, settle, 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 just a little wig, come up. Now what are we going to do? Then you're going to raise your voice, your palm is going to be down. About that. It says, what are we going to do? Ready, go. Softer, 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 so we can keep the voice raised over there. Hit it. You have to move with your foot. You've got to step. You can't go look at the way. Do look at the way. Come on, let's go. Come on. Come on. And what are we? No, softer. Come on. Hit it. Nice. Okay, you have two minutes to practice with each other. Go. Practice, practice, practice. One way to think about communication is put communication into size of the group in front of you. How long are you going to be with them? Do they know each other? It's a nice, easy way to understand group dynamics. So if I'm with a group for a very short amount of time, I'm doing keynoting. If I'm going to be with you for two hours, I'm not doing keynoting. I'm doing teaching. I have to understand, am I doing an elevator speech? Am I doing a keynote? Am I doing a training? Those are all different kinds of activities. And so you have to know which of the visual, auditory, kinesthetic, and breathing fit each of those. And I strongly suggest you'll have a better living and enjoy your professional growth more if you try to do a lot of those instead of just always have a niche. If you're always doing the same thing, you get into a routine and you don't uh, last year in June, I got to do 500 people in uh, Kiev, and I had a translator next to me. As soon as we had the first break, I pulled her off to the side. She was a very intelligent person, but she was used to the UN, where she's normally in a box back there. Everyone's wearing the heads, and she's translating word for word. I said, I'm not doing floor one. You have to do every gesture I do, because I'm doing floor two. Understanding the communication, the message, the medium that you're doing makes a huge difference. Now, I still want to go back to I want to suggest that most of us can do a very, very fine living being a coach if you know the structure of how to communicate from your nonverbals. So now someone has brought you in because they're not going to do a stand up, our revenue is down by 15%, but they still have to break the bad news. So, how do they do that? So here's an example of eight people around the table. Imagine, please. And I'm the person who's running the meeting. So if you would, thank you for coming today. Let's look at our agenda. 
On page two, you'll see that we're doing blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. That's the equivalent of, thank you for coming, blah, blah, blah. All nonverbals seated are more subtle than standing. So if you can do it standing, you'll notice what phase of the communication I'm in when you're seated. Thank you very much. Would you close your notebooks for a second? That's a surprise to everyone. Then you turn sideways, and you've got to turn those knees. You've got to get the toes pointing. Our revenue is down by 15%. Now watch. I want it to sink in. That's a long post pause. But watch. Now I have to get out of there. I can't go from here to there because I just brought that here. I have to do the same curl. I have to adjust my... Now I have this location and I have that location. Sorting this out makes all the difference in the world. Now join me as we do it. I'm going to do then you're going to do. So you're going to pretend that you're doing this. So make sure your chair is facing. Hey, thanks for coming today. Go. <laughs> Open your binder to page one. This is our agenda for the day. Before we begin, I'll turn sideways. You've got to make sure your toes and knees are pointed off to the side. Now pretend you have a paper. Pick it up and say, ready? Now the arm closest to my audience is the one I point with. I'm going to say our revenue, nice and slow, is down, nice and slow, by 15, nice and slow, percent. Go. Hold it for a second, hold it for a second. Pretend you're setting it on a table or a chair. Look at it, look at it. That's a long post pause. Now you're gonna curl. Your head is gonna come down. You're gonna come up off your bum a little bit and you have to spin around, ready? Still looking down, still looking down, still looking down. Now my head comes up and we can say, and what are we gonna do, ready, go. And what are we going to do? Palm goes down towards the negative. About, it's got to be a little, little bit louder on the, about that. About that. A little bit louder. About that. Because it's severe. Your voice volume has to duplicate in their mind how bad is it. If you take it lightly, you're not their leader. What are we going to do? Ready? Go. What are we going to do? Hit it. And that's where you have to turn just a little bit. Boy, it's so hard. We love the torque instead of turn. And if I may, that's why you have to be really careful what kind of chairs you're sitting in. Uh, when you get to the higher level, everyone has the rolling chairs. They have the arms. And everyone is talking with their arms resting on their... I'm going, that's bad communication. Come on, get off the furniture. Get off the furniture. Now, once you know how to do all of this... This is where the art comes into play. Example, I know how to do a pre and a post pause. I know how to just freeze my gestures. I know all of that stuff. But this is a group of people. I have nothing negative that we're going to cover. So it's back to our weekly meeting. And they know me, and I know them. So if I seem too stiff and artificial, and I just came from a Michael Grinder seminar, it won't work. So then what you do is, in my 45 minutes that I'm going to be with them, I have two or three times of about two minutes long where I have to say something important. That's when I use all these skills. I can lean on, do anything you want. I come to the first of two times where it's, I'm now going to be on because I want them to get it. Then I'll go back to being on. So when you learn this initially, but the art says when to do the science. It's a different level. So if I may, um, my daughter is going to take over my company. I'm 76 years old. She's been trying to kick me out for years. <laughs> I'm just a slow learner in terms of retirement. I went over to her house. And one of the things I was teaching her was if you want males and females, whenever you are a listener, it's better if you listen always with your hands like this. Now, this is belly button insecurity, but that's only bad if you're talking. If you're the listener, 
this is so perfect. This is a great listening posture. So I went over to my daughter's house, and she didn't know I was coming. I knocked on the door. She opened the door, and she went, oh, hi, Dad. <laughs> you have to practice. There's no getting around it. You do your post-its. I hope you're at five already. You do your post-its. One skill a week. And what a difference it makes. But it's got to be at a muscle memory level. Because under pressure, you have to already know how to do it. If you want to take the concept of decontamination, you may want to consider that decontamination, if you want to separate, is there's a couple areas in your world, your private world, where you want to keep positive. Try to keep the negative away, and that is where you eat and where you sleep. Those two have to be positive sanctuaries. The third one, if you want a third one, it's the back seat of your car. Some of you, it's at your mobile office, especially if you're an entrepreneur. When you walk in the house, where do you take all your nonverbals? Wherever you set the nonverbals, those are your reminders of work. Gail's doing a super job on me, and I appreciate that she runs a good ship, and I'm absolutely fine not being the captain of my house. She is, and I love her being that way. And one of the things she's taught me is that bag can never come out of the laundry room unless I'm going to work on it. I can't just walk in, set it on the table where we're going to eat. I mean, if you take off your scarf, where you throw the scarf, kick off your shoes, wherever you put the nonverbals of work, you're contaminating your home. Entrepreneurs contaminate their home so bad. I mean, it's where we work and live. Now, you, come on, you got to separate it. You got to separate it out. You'll get more energy. We have eight and a half acres. We're tree farmers up in the state of Washington. Seattle would be a good location to think of on a map. And so we were thinking of painting our bedroom. And we had a fight for two weeks. And we normally don't fight at all. We really tend to shovel while the pile's still small, if that makes sense. Work it what we did was we were trying to figure out why we were resisting painting the bedroom. And we realized it's where our office was. And we just, we just didn't like it. So we decided to take our lawnmower shed that was out on the 40 acres and make it into our office. It has revolutionized our relationship. You've got to figure out how to communicate. When are you at work and when are you at home? To yourself and then to other people. When our kids were still at home, I had a tie. And I oftentimes would be out in the office and I wanted to get some water. So I'd go over to the house and go in the house to get the water. And the kids would just tease me. Like in one case, it was a daughter who was supposed to mow the lawn. And as I was walking by, she said, if my dad told me where the gas can was, I could mow the lawn. I had the tie on. I'm not here. But for you to have people say, read my face, know what's going on. No, come on. Be clean and clear about the persona you're in with the people you live in love with. They need to know. What are your nonverbals that indicate you're preoccupied? How do you communicate that to other people? Now, in just a second, you're going to talk to your neighbor about where you sleep and where you eat in the backseat of your car. But only think of how you can change it. Don't reinforce it by saying, he's right, I am so cluttered, I can't. Don't reinforce it. We've already done the negative. Now go to the positive. What is the solution in terms of what's going on? Two or three minutes, talk to your neighbor. How to de This is a seven-step process. And as you probably know from the Judeo-Christian heritage, seven is a magical number. So if you can, whenever you create something, try to always have it be an odd number and try to have it be a number that is very deeply rooted in the culture that is in front of you. 
So any equivalent of seven, such as 21, those are all very powerful numbers on an unconscious level. The skills that we have not covered, I want to briefly show you. Then I want to open up for questions, because you've been very good sports in terms of let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. And if you're a high kinesthetic person, you're loved today. If you're a high visual person saying, can't we see a little more footage? So it's just a difference in terms of style and how you learn. If you would, step five. Step five says that your visual nonverbals supersede, take precedent over your kinesthetic nonverbals. So if you are going to point to something, that's a kinesthetic. If your eyes do not support the hand, the hand is an orphan. Your eye and hand have to always go together. If you're doing a PowerPoint, some recommendations. But tell the people what they're about to see. Or in the case of yesterday afternoon, it was brilliant. We had it flow so that you had a choice of looking at that or listening to the speaker. That's fine. I'm talking about more the corporate kind of presentation where you have to explain something or you're coaching someone who has to do PowerPoints. Have them say, our next slide is going to be about blah, blah, blah. Now turn, click it, stay still. Do not talk when they're reading because you're overloading their senses. That is different than what we did yesterday where we had pictures. Pictures are different than words. Pictures reinforce. Once they have finished seeing it, reading it, now you can talk. Where do you want their eyes? Your eyes have to be there. If you're working with someone one-on-one -on -one and you have something here and you're saying, I really want to show you this. This is important. She will tend to look back at me because I'm looking at her. So I have to have my eye and hand go together. Wherever my hand goes, my eye has to go because the visual nonverbals are more powerful than the kinesthetic nonverbals. The step six is what we've already covered, toes. Wherever your toes are is where your eyes will be. So if you're going to do five, you have to do six to do five. If I'm going to look off to the side here, I have to turn my body. Wherever the toes are, are where the eyes will be. So please stay away from twerking if you can. Number seven. Number seven is nothing to sneeze about. <laughs> I didn't enjoy it as much as you. I appreciate that. Number seven talks. Now look how late in the seventh step we finally got to the auditory. That's really, really, to me, a major breakthrough. Get the kinesthetics down. Get the visuals reinforcing the kinesthetic. Now you can go to your voice. That's a really high level. A credible voice pattern is when your voice is flat because your head is still. A still head will cause a flat voice. Try not to create voice patterns. Try to do kinesthetics that will produce the voice patterns. Watch my head. If I keep my head still and I talk, my voice comes out flat. If I bob my head, my voice will go up and down, unless you're Australian, and then you can have a still head and still have your voice go up and down. <laughs> it's part of the culture. That's why when Australians travel, they're always welcome in the Western world because they're never seen as a threat because of the rolling voice that you have as a culture. You go to New York City and they go anywhere, people don't like New York City people because they talk this way. So you literally can look at cross-cultural liabilities in terms of communication. Head still, flat. Head bob, rolling up and down. Now, all I have to do is take my chin and my palm and go like this. What we're going to cover today? My credibility just went up. If I take my palms, what we're going to be covering today, I increase my friendship. So be careful of when you say, I'm just being myself. 
you need to know if you're going to make a living, you are your product. And you will have blind spots because your self-image is what you were raised with compared to the people in your family and usually school, not university. And that's where you get your self-image. It's faulty. Don't trust how you see yourself. Trust how other people see you. That friend that in the past said, you know, when I first met you, now that I know you, that's a valuable friend. Tell me what your original response was. First impression. It'll make a huge difference in terms of going, okay, now I get it. There's me, then I'm my product. Two different things. If I would, I recommend, this is positional communication. This is personal communication. As a male, I still have to practice because today, Gail couldn't be on her computer, so I did my Skype to her phone. And I have to remember to bob my head. Because if I go like this, honey, how's your day been? We will get into a fight within three minutes. <laughs> but if I go like this, honey, how's your day been? We will talk 10 minutes longer than I wanted to talk. I'm not doing the topics because I'm interested in what the dog did, who's two years old. I'm interested in my marriage. What is your outcome? R, O, O, F. Make sure your voice fits what your outcomes are. I've got to make sure that I'm human when I'm talking to Gail. And what I find is, if I get in some of my journeys in foreign countries, I don't always have access to the internet. And if it's been three or four days, and I have not talked to her, and I have big audiences, I get disassociated. I get out of touch with myself. And what I find is I don't have a lot to share that's on a personal level, and that makes us separated. And she says, literally, when I come home, if I've done really big groups for short amounts of time, when I come in, she says, this is what you look like. Gail, where are you, you lucky thing? I'm home now. <laughs> you have to really be careful. Don't believe the Kool-Aid that you are drinking in front of other people. You got to remember who you are. And for me, the number one thing is staying in love. As you walk in my office, it literally says right there, we're here as a staff to fulfill Michael's dreams while he stays in love with Gail. I'm clear. We don't need the money. Gail allows me to work and discover and create patterns of nonverbal communication. And if I may, I'm aware that while I'm gone, our family is down one grandparent. I'm not. So it's a huge privilege for me to be in love with someone who will support me with my dreams, but will keep me in love at the same time. We're 43 years coming up. <laughs> Open time, questions, comments. We have microphones that will run around. Here comes one, Andy, right here. Please. Raise your hand. We have another mic. We'll get it to you right away. Please. Right. Uh, with the gesture of listening and getting their attention, you had the folded hands near the tummy. You take a contemplative point of looking. Yeah. Do they represent two different types of reception of what someone's talking about? So just to repeat, if you stand like this versus stand like this. Or city, or sitting or seated. mostly, yeah. OK. It depends on the culture. It depends on the audience. Uh, in general, the Asiatic audience if you are still, the interpretation is that you are thinking and you are not to be interrupted. In the Asiatic culture, if you're moving, you can be interrupted. And the, if you are just seated, then you're available. But if you're doing something, you're not available. So it depends on the culture. Yeah, great question. 
Please. Michael, the science that you showed with all of these yeah. specific ways to do this and not do this, I find it fascinating and very confusing. So I'm most curious about the place where the science and art meet, if you could demonstrate that for a moment. Oh. <laughs> Besides what I've done for the last two hours? <laughs> Um, I did an activity here, and I thought it was funny, and it failed. So what I did was I stepped off to the side, looking down, came over here, and I thought, Uh, science and our behaviors. So if you want, real easy. The first four is the what, the how, the when, and the if. Join me for those who want to. Four fingers sideways. Ready? The what, the how, the when, and the if. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi, Michael. We know that first impression lasts, especially for presentations. Uh, would you advise um, to start the presentation being more approachable or to start the presentation uh, being more credible? In terms uh, of rule of thumb. I don't think you can use either one of these. You have to know your audience. So before you ever get in front of people, figuring out oftentimes speakers will have a questionnaire they'll send ahead of time. That information will determine which one to do. The hardest one I find is when you have to acknowledge resistance. I think that's, that's when you know if you're really good on an art level. Thank you for coming. We're going to be talking about blah, 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 customer service, blah, 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 customer service. Now, before we begin, if I'm sitting where you are, I could care less about that. Now, look where my eyes are. I didn't look at you when I said the negative. And I will get out all resistance before I start. That, to me, is more important than credible and approachable. If there's resistance, do not let that elephant sleep. Wake it up. Wake it up. Now you get into the idea of, by the way, you know why I wouldn't listen to this? Do you know that you've had an increase of 12% phone calls coming in in service. <laughs> now watch, halfway back, I'm going to change. Oh, by the way, how long would you give any presenter before you figured out that maybe you could do even better than you're doing now? 10 minutes? 15? Thanks. I now leave that spot. I have amnesia. I was ever there. Now I'll open my program. So it's just a way of thinking about Credible approach, I think it's resistance and non-resistance. Last question. Last question, please. Yeah, Michael, you talked about um, some of the stories, like being a keynote and there's always trauma, and to receive that trauma away from the audience. Right. What if you wanted to explain how you felt after receiving that, Yes. but it's also bad? Yes. What do you do then? It's a series. So if I have one location where the tragedy happened and then there's the aftermath, you're just moving across the stage. But the other way to think about it, because as a group, you really did well yesterday going across the stage. I want to suggest step back, not this way, step this way, and you have what's called meta. Now you have a large about what, what happens. Sam Cawthon here, CEO and founder of Speakers Institute. If you give me 60 seconds of your time, I'll show you how to set up an online...
online webinar in 48 hours while growing your authentic followers to tens of thousands and then teach you how to package your IP so they buy your programs online using what we call influence on video. What this means is you talk to camera, share your value and then stack your offerings and create urgency in a way that makes it so irresistible that they click the button and purchase your high ticket sale. Talk with any of our clients globally and I promise you will not find anyone that does what we do. All you have to do is to create an online event, share your ideas and then stack your offerings just like this. And here's the big secret. Everyone is online right now searching for people just like you to help them learn things that you already know. There are people doing it right now but they probably don't know as much as you. So right now is your chance to learn how to sell online and my influence on video formula is easy to use and foolproof for anyone to master. Just recently, I did a one and a half hour video online to only 40 people and at the end, 10 of them bought my $4,000 product all by one click of the button. It was seamless. So if you want me to show you how to influence on video, stack your offerings that make it irresistible, learn my exact script so you can come across authentic and real and create urgency so then they buy immediately, then click on the link below and join my free masterclass. I mean, uh, how how good the feeling was after completing the session, and and, and I think the feedbacks uh, uh, were were just were just too good. So I mean, that is uh, that is forcing me to think beyond. Uh, I, I think it was pretty linear thinking earlier. Be helpful. Thank you, Charlene, Christiane, and Sam for obviously um, the benefit and the inspiration you've given to so many of us, and to all the participants because I think this is the first time I've felt that I've been in such a safe space to be vulnerable and to make mistakes. Um, and I know that a lot of us have shared some really traumatic um, events in our life, possibly for the first time publicly. So that's just been a really huge thing. So thank you for everyone for opening up, open up and be authentic. I'd like to firstly acknowledge you, Sam. Thank you so much for um, ins instituting the Speakers Institute and all of the lovely people who've attended today. I think they've done an absolutely wonderful job. I think all of their stories are worthy of stage presence. Um, I think you'll all go very far. I just wanted to say being out of the workforce for six years, looking after little kids, and this is the first course I've ever done. And it was astounding. It blew my mind. It was beyond my expectations. And thank you, Kate, for the feedback today. That was brilliant. And it's given me the confidence to back myself because I didn't have that before. Cause you know, when you leave for a while and you come back, it's all a bit dodgy. So thank you. And it was really an uh, experience which I was looking for to give that push, uh, the last push which is needed because I'm, I'm, I'm very low on, on execution. So your, your story and your message gave me that push which I, which I really needed. So thank you very much. And also to the fellow, fellow participant for bearing with me. Oh, thank you everyone. You've all inspired me today. And I want to thank you, Sam, for putting this on and Christiane and Charlene for, Charlene inspired me to come through the conversations we had. So I'd like to thank her in particular and got a lot out of it. So thank you everyone. And thanks for all the lovely comments. First of all, I would like to say thank you. Massive thank you to every single one of you. It, it was a great company. Proximity is power. Um, I'm overwhelmed with, the, um, with all the love and energy and everything else. I've learned so much. And by this sheer circumstances that I'm sitting at home and I actually can do it, I'm blown away that I'm actually doing it. It's amazing. And I really want to thank you, Sam, for this amazing course. Yeah, I just wanted to thank every single one of you, um, especially you, Sam, and um, all of the mentors as well. There can be at times where we're alone. We think we're the only ones, we feel like we're the only ones going through that. And to share would be to burden each other but in a space like this, it actually brings us closer together. So thank you very much for sharing um, all your stories and thank you for the opportunity. I'd actually just like to thank Sam and the team so much for everything you've done, but I'd really like to thank everybody else. I have learned so much from all of you. It's just been so exhilarating. I'm so excited for each and every one of you because it's just, 
the growth in such a short space of time has been phenomenal. So thank you all very, very much. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That has been absolutely awesome. I've learned a hell of a lot today and I really feel like we're all improving. So thank you so much. It's been really awesome. I wish everyone all the best on this on the course. I think it was a wonderful course. And Sam, you've created a, a, an amazing business. But I also want to congratulate the people you've got working underneath you because it wouldn't be that great if you didn't have all this wonderful resource. And, and I congratulate them for supporting you. It's excellent. Thank you very much. All the feedbacks were, were, were golden for me. I learned a lot. Plus, uh, how I should not try to put two, you know, I should not try to put all the information in those six minutes. I should let the audience absorb what I'm trying to convey. They should absorb my story. And, uh, you know, so as the energy level should, should fluctuate properly at the right moment. So thank you very much for that. So I want to say, look, I've forever been doing courses and programs. I've probably spent over $350,000 in my life. Um, this was worth every cent. I'm very, very knowledge of the coaches. Um, and they just kept offering gold nugget after gold nugget. Um, definitely was worth every minute as well. Yeah, I really want to thank the coaches. And, uh, and I've noticed a difference in everyone as well over the last couple of days as well. So, um, so thanks. Guys, I just wanted to say uh, my work relies on face-to-face -face, uh, workshops, speaking at conferences around the world. So investing in this course is really about looking to the future. So it's really an investment in the long term. It's been a really, really professionally put together course. So commendations all around to all of you. To all the staff from Speakers Institute, you guys have been really supportive and really, really lovely and encouraging. But to everybody else, for all of your honesty and your courage for stepping up here and just giving all, because I've learned so much from every single one of you and it's just been really, really good. Thank you. My name is Sarah Cordner and a long time ago, I was one of the protégés. Now back then, I had absolutely no idea where I was going to go. I was an expert in my field, but I was working very much in the corporate space. I also had no followers on any social media accounts. I had no email list. I had no people anywhere on a database that was out there in the public market. But I knew that I needed and wanted to get out, get online and make a difference to the world. And I knew that the only way I'd be able to do that is to go out and start speaking, putting myself out there as an individual. And it was really confronting because there's all these kind of things that we go through. Will people like me? Will people engage with me? Will anyone even care about what I have to say? Will people mock me? Will people criticize me? Will I be torn down by my competitors or trolls? So I had all of these all of these worries, like everyone else does, not knowing where I was going to start. You know, do I start the message, the thing, the branding, <laughs> the story? It's all very, very overwhelming. So I want to reassure you guys that I was absolutely there. After going on Sam's program, um, I have gone on to um, win multiple awards. I have now got over 20,000 students in 146 countries. I have been listed by the Huffington Post as one of the top 50 must follow female entrepreneurs. I've published 12 books, five of which have gone to international number one bestseller. I recently was headhunted by a university and now hold the record for being the youngest university director in Australian history. And I have done all of this from working in the spare bedroom in my house and now have a multi-million dollar education company with children running around and one of the things that I really want to make clear to other people is that everyone can do this every single person I had no special starting point I had no investors I've never had anyone give me money I absolutely have just started on the corner of a kitchen table with nothing but a dream a drive and an ambition and that is the only thing you need to get started I've just finished a three-day boot camp with Speakers Institute. I can't recommend this highly enough. If you're wanting to be a public speaker, if you're wanting to improve your public speaking, definitely look at coming along to this boot camp. You'll be pushed out of your comfort zone, but you'll learn so much. Absolutely worth it. Why is connection important? Why do we need to connect to people? If you don't connect to people, you will not survive. Your brain, your human brain, you all have one, you're all human. It's designed to connect. You are innovative and you are creative. You are a nurturer and you're a carer. This is the Celebrity Authority Show. Please welcome your host,
Sam Cothel. Hey, I am excited. We have Grace Harris in the studio. Welcome, to, welcome to the Celebrity Authority Show, Grace. Hello, Sam. Thank you for having me. Very excited. Thank you. So, Grace, you're a, you're like a transformational coach and also an entrepreneur. Uh, tell us some more about what exactly is a transformational coach. A transformational coach is uh, someone who, well, there are different levels of inspiring and motivating people. So the first one would be to inspire people. Mm. So just give them some inspiration, Mm. provide them some thoughts, some wisdom, experience perhaps. And then you get to motivate them. You know, you move them to do action. Mm. They might go home and be really pumped. Could be for a week, a month. But then to transform them is quite different. Because you're not only inspiring and motivating people, Sam, you're actually pushing them beyond their limits. You're challenging them. You're lifting them away from their uh, comfortable zone. So I do that. Um, Yes, and I love it. Uh, Look, that is really inspiring and also transforming as well, which I love. Grace, I'm interested to unpack that in a moment, but share with us a little bit more about your personal journey. What brought you to this to this place of you know being an expert in personal development in a way so tell us more about your story yeah sure um it was really organic so i was born and raised in the philippines and uh, when i was five i was um, abandoned and left behind by my (coughs) parents and uh, so that was that was okay i mean i'm okay with it now it was a decision that was made how old were you four or five do you um, remember? Yes, yes, so I do. So you were abandoned by your parents. How, how did yeah. they do that? It wasn't, uh, well, it was simple. So we went, I was told we're going to visit your grandmother. And so, yeah, you visit, you know, You're blue dress and yeah. all, yeah, it was a visit. And then I was told, you stay here, I'll be back this afternoon. But I did. I waited all day. And At your uh, grandma's house? Yes. She was there though? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. yes. Um, and that was it. They didn't come back? No. So um, I understand that now. It's people make decisions, yeah? And that's what happened. But then it was more about how I had to raise myself. And that's, that's where it all started because it wasn't, it was very colorful, texture wise. And um, how do you mean by colorful? As okay. in, it was fun, it was challenging, it was memorable, but it was also traumatic. You must have had some level of resentment toward your parents initially. I mean, I can see now that you've forgiven them, but initially... Um, that, yes, that, for a long time. Traumatic. not toward for a five-year-old. Yeah. Not towards my dad, because he wasn't there. But then my mom was... She made the promise. So it was difficult, but then it took me a long time. It carried, um, it, it came with me for about, for, for approximately three decades. And I didn't even know. See, that's how it was organic because how do you I, mean you didn't know? I didn't know that I resented her. Because you get so busy. Um, so did you see her at all during those 30 years? Like, when was the next time you saw her after, after she abandoned you? Um, a few times. She didn't live var- very far away, like four blocks away. <laughs> um, so she would visit sometimes. Not me, but just visit as in be present. Uh, I don't really know the purpose of the visit because there were no conversations. It was just like she's a different... She there was, was no you know, emotional no. connection to you. So that was okay. I mean, it wasn't okay. I wasn't consciously not okay with it. It was only later on when I really, um, so, um, yeah. Yeah, so organic. Very organic. And then, and so you, you, what, like grandma took care of you? No, I did. At five years old? Yes. And um, so I'm gonna be very vulnerable with you and um, yeah, it was it wasn't it wasn't easy, and um, f- 
And I did it. So I, I, I've been through proper school. I've been through um, a college education. I had a sponsor. I was a scholar for my auntie. And uh, the texture was so, um, the contrast was, was enormous. Like I had poverty, I had abuse. But then she would take me, she would prophesy on me. Like she would take me shopping and she would go. Um, Who would your grandma? No, my auntie. Okay. She lived overseas and she would visit once a year. She would prophesy and she would take me shopping. She would go, this is going to be your life. It's going to be so good. And then she would leave. So it was bad again. So, but, so I had. So your auntie was an inspiration. Oh, uh -huh, absolutely. The hope. She, she planted a seed of hope. Wow. Yeah. And she sounds amazing, your auntie. Oh, and um, <laughs> so it was colorful. And then I went through education. Mm. And then I, um, I was ambitious. You know, I went through law school. And in law school, people just triggered me, Sam. Like, because um, my classmates were doctors and lawyers and professionals. And I was like 20 years old, and they would hit on me. I was like, this is the last thing that I need with my mental state, because I just didn't like people. So I thought, no, law school's probably going to have to wait. And so I actually... Well, sorry, sorry, why didn't you like people at the time? Did you just feel that you, you were abandoned, so people will... So you, you found it hard to trust them again? When you grow up with abuse and emotional abandonment, you will always carry, not forever, but while you haven't addressed that, you will always carry a level of lack of trust mm. and faith. Yeah. And that's towards others and yeah. towards yourself. Yeah. And so when, pe when, when you go and do something that you want to do and people just hit on you as a woman, it's very triggering. And I knew that if, if, if somebody triggers me, there's just, it's not pretty. So I thought, okay, this will have to wait. And, and then I went on to actually leave the city. I, I really need, needed to leave the city. And, and even with that, I had to struggle explaining why I'm leaving the city, you know? Because in Asia, um, in, in traditional families, even if you're not that close, it doesn't make sense that you are actually trying to get out of the herd. Like sorry, where about in Asia? Was it? Sorry. So that's in the Philippines. It was in yep. the Philippines. In the so southern in Philippines. Oh, okay, no, so no. Yep. Okay. And that's where I wanted to go because I would read things on the paper. Oh, you know, Manila is a big city. There are a lot of opportunity. I want to go there. I want to be free. I want to be by myself. I just want to explore. And there is, you know, I've been prophesied that my life is going to be great. So I had to actually come up with some story that I'm going over there to do something like a yeah. training or something. And I'll come back in six months. I was never going back. So I left. And um, so that was really good for me because I was there for a few years and then I met, I met a man and I fell in love with him and he happens to be Australian and he proposed that we live here. And so I said, and, and I thought, well, that would be nice. But what was really funny was um, I knew, well, you know, um, we're together and he's Australian, but I just never, ever bothered to ask where Australia was. So I thought... <laughs> you didn't well, know where Australia well, was. Well, I, I kind of thought it was next to Canada. I thought, okay, that's... <laughs> so I was packing all these um, jackets and all of that, and, and we land in Queensland, Brisbane. <laughs> and, it gets better. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, okay, um, what, what season is it? Is it summer? And he, he was like, no, it's August. We just finished winter. Okay, like, um, yeah, so then I really decided no I'm bad at geography how, how, but <laughs> how, how long ago was this this right? is um, 18 years ago wow. but and but then I we just we just started driving on the highway and and the roads were so wide in the space have you been to Manila yeah I have. okay yeah. so you know what the roads are like yeah, it's actually one of the worst cities in the world when it comes to traffic in the world yep so I drove there. So if you can drive there, you can drive anywhere. You can drive anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I was um, in M1, Brisbane, going down to the Gold Coast. And I'm th thinking, oh, my God, these are the roads here. And I tell you, even to this day, 18 years on, are driving in Australia, not in different countries. <laughs> I would just drive, and I just can't stop being grateful. Well, the, you know, it's, this is the road that I'm driving on. It's just this, it was beautiful. And... Yeah, so, so that was organic for me, and 
continue on the journey. Um, so we got married. We had beautiful children. Um, it didn't work out. And then I became a single mom. And then someone told me, you know, you have to get a job because um, you just have to. It's not going to be enough that you don't. And I thought, yeah, of course. So I st actually began my, my career organically again. I went to a, um, a job search um, shop. I think they called it Mission Australia. Yeah. And I just said to them, look, um, I want a job. You don't have to pay me. I'll just work for you. And so they said, okay. So I started working for them. And then six months later on, I, and they decided, look, you, you've got to get a proper job. You've got to get paid. I said, okay. So then I started looking online. And my one agenda was 2486, which was the zip code I was living. Like, I need to be five minutes away from That's my children. Funny. And the only people that would accept me was the bank. Like, I want to... You know, like it was just the bank accepted me. So I became a banker and um, so that was organic again. And that career really um, increased my trust in people wow. and my love for people. Wow. Yeah. Grace, can I just uh, very quickly just go back to what you said earlier on. You said it wasn't until 30 years later when you resolved with your mum. Yes. Uh, I'm sure there are people out there that you know, maybe bitter towards another human being because of something that might have happened in their past. Would you mind sharing us how you resolved with your mum? Sure. Um, a certain psychologist said to me, write her a letter and don't send it. But then we are in the age of typing a letter, not writing a letter. So I did that and the send was just too easy to hit. And <laughs> So you sent it? Yes, I sent it. It, and was, what, what was, it was explosive, Sam. I don't remember everything, but it was explosive. And she was uh, distant. She was distant. And, um, and it started from there. And then I went home on my... How do you mean by it was distant? So she didn't reply? She did. Like and that. she said something around the lines of, you're special to me. Um, I didn't realise that's how I made you feel. And it was a long time ago. That's what she said. And I thought, well, that's better than no response or that's better than actually swearing back at me. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and then I went home for my 40th and it was uh, interesting because I had a big party. I have like, I do still have a lot of friends there. I had a big party and everyone was invited. It was massive and she came wow. and we never spoke. I saw her, she saw me, we never spoke. This was yeah, a few years ago now. But that was okay because we, there was still a photo of the two of us together. I don't know how that happened. I must have been drunk. But um, uh, yeah, so, and then I actually um, went to your boot camp not long ago, less than six months ago. And you had this, um, what did you call it? An incomplete conversation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's the one. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, so you asked everyone. You explained to everyone what an incomplete is, and you said you cannot go on to this boot camp if you are incomplete. And um, I thought, okay. And <clears throat> you know, um, my first reaction to what you said, to your instructions was, no, <laughs> absolutely. That's what I said, like verbally out loud to myself. But then, Around this time, I'm already an entrepreneur. I've, I've already been immersed to personal development, intense personal development. That's what I do now. I coach people um, in business and PD. So I already, I already worked through it. So there was a voice behind me going, is that the best you can do? Say no. I'm thinking, oh God, here we go. So I'm thinking, I'm, I'm scrolling on my phone and there was a number for my mom. And I said, okay, I'll give it a go. I dialed it and it said, the number you dialed is not in service. I'm like, yes. Mm. That voice again saying, is really, really, is that really the best you can do? So that's the, that's the recovering, that's the voice of a person who's really transforming herself. You can, all you can do and think, okay. And, and, and just to give people a background here, um, but basically whenever you have an incomplete, what an incomplete is, is something where you might have an ill feeling towards another human being. And the only way to complete an incomplete is to have a forgiveness conversation. So the challenge that we had in our boot camp experience was you have to go and have this forgiveness conversation. Sorry, I just wanted That's to okay. mention that. So, yeah. so, so you you've found given, the number? You've given me five minutes or ten minutes. Um, I didn't find the number, but the voice said I have to do, I can do something better. So I've actually stalked my mom, literally, as in social media, called people, what's her number?
And I got it in a couple of minutes. It's yeah. that easy. So when if you really then, want, yeah, yeah. If you really want to do something, there are no excuses. Great. And I, I was not going to go through the three days incomplete because that was, you know, it's just not the thing to do if you want to grow. And I called her and, oh, my God, I was so surprised. She was so happy to hear from me. She, yeah, she was, and she was the most forgiving, soft, completely open person. And I'm just like, yeah. And I was like, okay, well, that's great. Yeah, it really set me up. Wow. Uh, and I suppose that's what, what makes you a real transformational coach because you've had the transformation yourself. Yes. And so you're speaking from conviction and from experience to help other people. Is that right? Yes, yes. You can only transform people if you are continuously transforming every day. Yourself. Yeah. Yes. And if there are people out there that want to, that need a level of transformation, is there an easy way to help us and coach us how to do that? Oh, absolutely. Um, I do now talk about being unapologetic, and, and that's about the paradigm of self-love. The, the one thing where you have to start Art, to transform yourself is from a place of self-love because this is what's been taken away from you Great. and so that's what you've got to learn and identify all our life we operate from self-love but mm. it's just we have different paradigms for it excuse mm. me you know um, so in the paradigm of self-love that I teach there are four key questions really that you need to start from you need to ask yourself at any given moment what is your state what is your state yes when that's you're right. making a decision what is your state are you happy are you sad and then you've got to you've got to ask yourself are you growing from this experience right and if you are not growing that's okay but are you learning right yep and if you know you could be growing next time but as long as you're learning right now yeah. now is this what whatever you is you are doing now short-term solution or a long-term solution because a short-term one could be a knee-jerk mm. reaction mm. that's not necessarily going to serve you in the long term mm. now by identifying and answering these questions you get to identify where do you belong in the paradigm the paradigm of self-love is a spiral paradigm sam so it's either you're spiraling up to your life right. or you're spiraling down very yep. good hey uh look I, I just love this interview and thank you so much for coming along here on the show um yeah, w w what do you do for you now to recharge so you can still operate at the level that you do have as a as a mum, as an influencer? W what do you do for you to recharge yourself? I do yoga and people think that's like, you know, exercise. It's not. It's actually eight limbs. I do the four limbs every day, which is asana, um, pranayama, yamas and niyamas. So you, just to make it simple for you, pranayama is meditation. Asana is where you actually stretch yourself, you bend your body, you twist your body. And that's really good for your organs and all of that. So I can't live without that. But if I was to really, if I was so, if there was one thing that's left for me to do every day, I would choose gratitude. Yeah, and, and that's, I can't live without Very being good. grateful. Written, verbal, mental, if I'm feeling out of sync, out of center, that's what I need. Right. Grace, thank you so much for coming along the show. However, look, just before you go, we actually have a bit of a challenge, a bit of fun. Okay. Uh, it's 10 questions in 60 second challenge. So Grace Harris, do you accept the challenge? I do. All right, Grace, your time starts now. Favorite color? Pink. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite food? Mexican. Mexican. Favorite celebrity? Uh, that would be Tony Robbins. Yes. Favorite actor? Johnny Depp. <laughs> yes. Lisa Nichols. Oh, she's amazing. Favorite book? Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon right. Hill. Yes. yes. Favorite movie? Memoirs of a Geisha. Yeah, that's a great. Yeah. Uh, favorite city? Uh, as of now, Paris. Mm. Favorite drink? Uh, and, and camembert. And That's not Grace, if you could be an animal, which animal would you be? A tiger. Why a tiger? I'm attracted to the eyes. Mm. It's like an entrance to the soul. Grace, thank you so much for joining us here on the Celebrity Authority Show. Our next 10x speaker is a triple Paralympian. 
a world record holder and founder of the charity Sporting Dreams. She knows about setting and achieving goals. Her success has been honoured with accolades, including Queensland Young Achiever of the Year, Cosmopolitan's Fun Fearless Female Award. I didn't even know there was a Cosmopolitan Fun Fearless Female Award. <laughs> in the Young Australian of the Year Awards. And it has an honorary degree as an Olympic torch bearer. This next 10X ties together a lot of what we've been hearing about over this conference, about goal setting. But our next speaker is talking about heart goals, not smart goals. Please welcome to the stage, Mareka Yonkers. I found myself lying face down in intensive care. I'd been sliced open from my neck to my tail. The pain was out of this world and the tubes came from places you cannot even imagine. <laughs> As I lay in that bed, I looked sideways and I saw this object, a pink electric wheelchair. I hated it. I did not want that to be my life. There I had been in the prime of my life, defining myself by true things, the knowledge that I had the mental toughness to overcome anything that came my way, and that my arms were so strong that they could carry my legs and the rest of my body. Now suddenly, I had an overuse injury from too much swimming, too much using my arms, and a life-threatening infection. I didn't know if I was going to live or die. I had to face the fact that I was about to watch my race that I had spent 20 years training for on the television instead of being in the swimming pool. And in that moment, in that hospital room, I had a choice. A choice to win and keep going and setting goals or to reevaluate the way we set goals in the first place. I had an epiphany. I didn't know how to be a good hospital patient, but I knew how to be a good swimmer. And for 15 years, I had been a motivational speaker, teaching audiences how to leverage athlete peak performance mindset to lead a gold medal life. Because after all, what would you rather? One gold medal or a really fulfilling lifetime? So I was about to become my very own student as I went through my biggest adversity. On the dais, you see them standing up going, yahoo, and smiling and waving for the cameras. But let me tell you, that moment is great. It's fantastic. I would not trade these for anything in the world. The moment I won them. And, okay, yes, they're real. They taste disgusting. <laughs> I do not know why athletes do that pose. However, I think we have something back to front when we look at athletes and gold medals as the medal for goal setting. Because what happens after gold or after goal, duh, after you've achieved your goal? This is the question I want you to think about today. If you were the gold medalist in your life, what would you be doing right now to get you where you want to be in your future. WIN is an acronym. I want you to burn into your minds what's important now. Today, I want to teach you about heart goals and why this is the future of goal setting, not just SMART goals. When we set a goal that we are so passionate and connected to in our heart that no matter what steps in our way, we will achieve it, that is a heart goal. Heart goals are healthy for our physical and mental well-being. They burn, don't burn us out 
and they don't physically break us down like my sporting career did to me. They respond to our rapidly changing environment that we live in today. Smart goals were invented in 1981. I was born in 1981. Some of you might have noticed more things than me that have changed since 1981. So is it wise that we continue to set our goals the way that people did in 1981? Thought for you. The next one is achievement. If a goal does not have a sense of fulfillment, why are we going to want to achieve it? It's got to enhance our relationships and present teachable moments. Now, where did this wisdom come from for me? From the naivety of a young child. I was four years old watching the Olympics on TV in a little pink wheelchair when I set my first goal. I'd never even heard the word goal, but I set this goal. I saw the Olympics, and the people were marching in the green and gold uniforms representing Australia, and I visualized myself on that TV. I was going to do that. That was my destiny. You might think that's a little unusual for a small child. I was always a bit different as a child. See, I used that little pink wheelchair, and this was a wonderful thing. I was given the gift of disability as a small child. And disability didn't mean to me something bad. It just meant I was never going to be like everyone else, so I didn't have to waste my time trying to fit in. This was very liberating. I could just be who I wanted to be. I quickly learned that my arms could be my legs. And if I wanted to climb a ladder, I used my arms. Corporate ladder or otherwise. <laughs> That little girl went on and wrote a bucket list of 100 things to achieve in her lifetime. This is a visual representation of the ones that have been achieved by age 23. Wow. The powerful thing is not the medals. It's the one in the bottom corner, the media story about changing the lives of other athletes. Because for me, setting a goal this is bigger than yourself when you're faced with an obstacle that may be life or death, how are you going to keep going? For me, that changed when that little girl in the pink wheelchair was told she was not going to go to high school because there was not a wheelchair accessible high school. And suddenly my goal went from Mareka needs to win a medal to Mareka needs to leverage her platform as an athlete in the media to bring about change. We took the government to court. I won. Me and every child in Queensland now has an equal opportunity to get an education at high school. And that is the power of a goal bigger than yourself. Now, if I think the weather is a little cold and I don't feel like going training, there's one billion people around the world living with a disability. One in five Australians who perhaps are not getting the chance to live their life to their fullest potential because people like me are not out there sharing the word with everybody else, how we can be a more inclusive society. And that is the driver behind my desire to win a medal, not the tangible objects you see behind me. In actual fact, these are usually lost and my family hate it when I'm giving a speech because it means searching the house. <laughs> Now, obviously, if you wish to be successful, you're going to need a supportive environment. We all know this. But in heart goals instead of smart goals, this means something very different. You might notice I like to decorate an environment to make it feel like home. I have decorated this stage. But environment is the key thing between heart goals and smart goals. Smart goals are very specific and have a plan. What happened if the plan changed halfway through? In my sporting career, I was told less than a year before my final Paralympics that my event had been taken off the program. Now, if I stuck to my rigid plan of swimming 50 meters breaststroke in September in Beijing, I would not be standing on this stage with medals because the plan was gone. I needed to move on and do something else. I did, I chose a new stroke. The next example is here. 
the snorkel. I woke up one morning with what I didn't know was a lifelong injury to my neck. I merely thought I couldn't turn my head. And I said, hey coach, I can't turn my head. No worries, mate. You don't need to turn your head to um, swim. Um, yes, coach, but what about to breathe? <laughs> and there came my supportive environment. My teammates in the squad. Hey, Marika, you just need a snorkel. And so I started eight months of snorkeling like this onto the Australian team, two Paralympic medals later. That is adapting to a changing environment and getting your goal to happen. Now, do you think I felt a sense of achievement having done that, that I needed to grow new skills? Because that is what's required for each of us. If we want to set a true heart goal, we need to achieve something, and it needs to add to our relationships, the people around us, make our life richer. But my favorite letter is T, the teachable moments. Because all those years, I thought I had to keep killing my body to do better and better at sport so I could make my difference in the world. Turned out all I had to do was lie in the hospital bed and answer the phone. The call came from one of the speakers bureaus in this country who I had been trying to get signed by for years, requesting me to be the ambassador for a Queensland-wide campaign that was going to change the way lives worked for anybody injured in a motor vehicle accident in Queensland living with a disability in the future. Suddenly, I was doing what that little girl in the pink wheelchair always dreamed of. And what is the moral of this story? It is therefore that if we followed SMART goals, does anyone think I can get to the top of this ladder? Now that my arms are not strong and they're broken, I cannot climb it with my arms anymore. And this pink wheelchair that I hated, it still, does it still suck? No, I learned to dance with the adversity and lean into it. I love it. And when I did, I found out this chair does a pretty cool trick. Have you watch it? Think about what you need to do now to win. What's important now? Shout it back to me. What do you need to do? What's important now? What are we going to do? Win. We're going to lead our very own gold medal life. Heart goals win. Thank you. Believe me, words are powerful. It was not at all in the mind frame to join the boot camp. But I don't know how to market myself. Sabotage yourself. Appreciate the person you see in the mirror. And that one line I didn't know will change me so much that within a week, I was able to prove myself. Boot camp is a lot of energy, a lot to learn, and the proximity that you are involved in. And you are with the best. That I have left of the person I was three days back, and today I am someone different, going ahead, really going to accomplish my dreams. The one key lesson that I would be addressing upon from now on will be showing my story. Showing my story in a, in a way that people really get inspired. You're, you're an absolute powerhouse. You, you can't help but listen to you. You demand the attention of the room. You're so congruent. I can see it in your eyes. I can see it in your heart that you believe in every single word that you say. Today I know my story is important and story has everything. But it's just that I have to show it to them so that I'm able to inspire more lives around. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in for today's episode here at Speakers TV. My name is Sam Cawthorn and we are super excited about Speakers TV and about these episodes that we bring to you every single weekday as well as also on every single Saturday. Guys, we'd love to hear from you. If you've got any feedback at all for us, or maybe you want to comment right down, right now in the chat bar about what was your biggest takeaway from today's uh, session. But also not only that, why don't you join us? 
So here at Speakers Institute, we do have a number of programs such as our online boot camps or our protege program at Speakers Tribe here. We're all about running these big, large annual conferences every year, but also not only that, there is an annual membership that you can get. We're in your city. We do have tribe gatherings, all really encouraging you going from where you are today to where you really want to be. Or maybe you want to tell your friends and your family about Speakers TV, but can I please encourage you? Why don't you like like this page? Why don't you join us each day? Why don't you tell other people about these episodes? Because we are all about really helping you on this journey to becoming that recognized voice of authority for you to find your message and your story and get that out there into the world. We are super excited about your journey. So please lean in and join us today. To your success, my name is Sam Cawthorn. And don't forget, the best is yet.